So uh, most of you know uh, myself, uh, I'm the head of the business and property group here in St Philip's uh, Chambers uh, with a strong emphasis on uh, insolvency work. Uh, and sitting to my left is uh, James Morgan at King's Council, also many of whom will, you will uh, know, uh, one of our eminent silks uh, here in Chambers. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to hand over to James uh, to open our talk on BTI against the corner. Uh, thank you, Mark. So what we're going to cover today, quick introduction, um, brief summary of the facts, some key points of law, some unanswered questions, some more interesting points, and then what we think is practical advice um, going forward. So here we are, 17 months waiting for judgment between the hearing of the appeal uh, and the handing down. 160 pages, I know you've all read it, so we're really just reinforcing what you already know. 451 paragraphs. Um, and people saying, well, this is questions of considerable importance for company law, Lord Reed. Lady Arden said, momentous decision for, for company law. And you've already seen on LinkedIn and Lexology and everything else, thousands of lines of articles, which bring us to the big question. Is it really worth all the fuss? Have you wasted your morning other than coming uh, for some breakfast and some coffee? Well, let me put you for, let me put forward the cases why this is not really very re revolutionary. Uh, first of all, although um, counsel uh, for the defendants in the Supreme Court had a go at it, um, he was really the first person for 20 or 30 years, perhaps ever, to seriously argue uh, that there shouldn't be some kind of duty towards creditors. I've called it here the creditor duty. We'll see what the judges uh, called it a, a little bit later. Um, so really, this was, this was quite, a, quite a brave submission. At uh, one point, just picking it up now that's clear, it's a duty to the company, it's not a duty to the creditors, in the same way it's not a duty to shareholders, it's to the company, and that's the theme that runs through, there was no serious uh, issue about that. Secondly, all this, obviously people, if it's actually insolvent, there wasn't much doubt there was going to be a duty. The arguments were, well, should there be a duty before actual insolvency? According to the Lordship's uh, judgment, uh, her ladyship's judgment, there's no previous case where the result had turned on there being a duty before actual insolvency. All the case law being the companies were actually insolvent. So this, this debate was really rather academic. And then a point which I, I don't think has been drawn out despite the 450 odd paragraphs in great detail in the judgment is what is actual insolvency? Well, as we know from the cases we've got on there, actual insolvency involves an element of looking to the future. So in other words, you can be insolvent before you're actually insolvent in one sense of the word. So we've got rechain finance, which was a decision of, um, as he then was, Mr. Justice Briggs. Uh, we'll see him uh, later in the judgments in Sequana, talking about the cash flow test. And you can look at, debts that are reasonably likely to fall due in the near future. So if this week you're paying the debts, so there's a debt going to be coming up in two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, maybe a month or two, the precise parameters of that haven't been um, resolved, and you're not going to be able to pay it, you're cash flow insolvent now. One little rider to that, it does have, to, it's a commercial test, it's a practical test. It does have to be an endemic shortage of cash, you just pay, don't fail to pay one bill for ten pounds, you know, because you've overlooked it, or it's just a real temporary short problem. Then you're probably not cash flow insolvent. And then we've got Eurosale, the big balance sheet um, uh, case in the Supreme Court. Um, you look at contingent and prospective liabilities. So again, looking to the future. So actual insolvency itself already has these elements of futurity in it. So then the question is. These are the phrases which are used in the judgment. Imminent insolvency or bordering on insolvency, which a lot of ink was spilt about, a lot of argument was uh, debated. Is that really different from actual insolvency? Now, I think you can probably think of examples as to where it might be, but in the real world, in the practical world, how many times is that actually going to matter 
uh, and make a difference to the to the cases. So anyone wants to leave now, uh, some bacon sandwiches left, that's fine. Uh, but there are, of course, some interesting and some important points. Just in terms of the structure of the judgment, um, I find it most helpful to go to the judgment of Lord Briggs first, um, with whom Lord Kitchen agreed. I think that's the second judgment as you read through the report. <clears throat> then to go back to Lord Reed, and then to look at Lord Hodge, because there's quite a lot, a high degree of overlap between those judgments. Um, Lady Arden's judgment is, comes last in time. Uh, it's an epic. She takes quite a different view on a number of points um, to the, uh, the, the lordships. And part two of her judgment, which is essentially anything you ever wanted to know about the history of company law in relation to this area is all there. So those are the, those are the judges. And what were the facts, Mark? Yeah, so um, it's easy to discuss this all in a vacuum, um, but we do have to remember what the facts were in this case, because um, they're fairly uh, stark. Uh, we go back to May 2009, uh, AWA, uh, its directors, caused it to distribute a dividend to its only shareholder, Sequana, and a dividend in the sum of 135 uh, million euros. That dividend had the effect of extinguishing a debt owed uh, by Sequana to AWA. So uh, it becomes about uh, a net zero position between them. Uh, the dividend was follow or followed all of the relevant processes of the Companies Act 2006. Uh, all of the protections in there uh, in relation to lawful dividends uh, were followed uh, to the uh, T. And at the time, AWA was solvent, both on a balance sheet basis and on the cash flow basis. Now, the issue was that it had a long term contingent liability of an uncertain amount in relation to uh, an environmental uh, liability. Uh, it had made a provision in its accounts uh, in relation to that potential future liability. And that's why it could say uh, it was solvent. Uh, however, uh, it was long term and the ultimate amount of that liability uh, was uncertain at the time. So there's a risk and that risk is real that AWA might become insolvent at an uncertain point in the future, not imminent, but at some point off in the future. But it's not probable that that's the case because it's made a provision in its accounts. It's only if the liability turns out to be greater than the uh, provision that it's made, that it'll turn out to be insolvent. Uh, just under 10 years later, AWA goes into insolvent administration. Uh, and uh, the claimant and appellant is BTI. Uh, it took an assignment of AWA's claims against the directors. Uh, and it claimed the amount of the dividend from the directors, saying the fact that there was a real, uh, but uh, not probable, but real, as opposed to fanciful risk of insolvency in the future, meant that the directors owed the duty to the creditors and therefore should not have paid out uh, the uh, dividend. So those are the circumstances in which uh, this comes uh, to be considered. I'll hand you back to James. Um so does the duty exist at all? Well, you've, I've obviously trailed this already. There is a form of uh, creditor duty. And what I've done is I've put all the things, all the judgments, all the summary of them on this issue on one page, because I found that quite a helpful way to, to look at it. And I've done that for the next slide as well, so we can see where the, the overlaps and where the differences are. And um, what do we call it? Well, Lord Briggs and Lord Kitchen called it the creditor duty. The other judges didn't like that. They either call it the rule in West Mercia or the West Mercia duty after the case um, in the Court of Appeal, I think 20 years ago, with West Mercia. I'm not sure I like the rule in West Mercia. Well, that's the rule in West Mercia, huh? but it's not the rule in East Mercia or in West Yorkshire. <laughs> um, so I'd probably go for uh, West Mercia duty or creditor duty. I think creditor duty is better because um, otherwise your client's going, well, what's, the, what's, West Mer what's, the, you know, what's that all about? Uh, well, it's not perfect. I think it's it's a better description. So it does exist. We'll talk about the content uh, in a moment. Um, if we're interested in theory, why does it exist? Well, the reason that actually comes through 
all of the judgments is this. Look, there's going to come a point if the company goes into insolvent liquidation or insolvent administration where in an economic sense, not a proprietary sense, but an economic sense, the creditors will have the main stake in the company and in its assets. Now, if you get to that stage and their interests have been ignored up until that point, then those rights and those interests are going to be even more vanishingly small than they often are in this situation. So when that is in prospect, quite how in prospect it is, we'll need to see, they have a, their interest should be uh, recognized in advance to effectively provide some form of protection against that ultimate economic interest in the assets of the company in insolvent liquidation. And that runs through the uh, judge's reasoning and that's perfectly um, sensible and understandable. Um, the majority um, found it very helpful to look at section 172.3 of the Companies Act, which if you recall, refers to preserving the duty, if any, um, in respect of creditors. Um, and they said that's really Parliament recognising there was some form of duty, um, but the precise parameters of it still remain to be worked through, at least until um, this case. Uh, Lady Arden took a very different view in her exhaustive study of the white papers and the consultations leading up to the 2006 Companies Act. Uh, she said, section 172.3, doesn't say that at all. It left it entirely open, but she's very much in the minority on that. And so we can put that uh, on one side. Just one or two other points to pick up. And um, Lord Briggs and Lord Kitchen dealt particularly with section 214 of the Insolvency Act. So wrongful trading, because one of the arguments is you've got wrongful trading. Why do you need any form of creditors duty? Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Mark will cover that. Uh, but that was regarded as not being a bar to the creditor's duty because there's different functions in different time periods. Um, for the uh, professional advisors in the room, you may be interested to know that Lord Hodge took the view that having a creditor's duty assists professional advisors to encourage directors to act responsibly. I think he envisaged you sitting down, remind them about the duty and then taking uh, different actions than they uh, might otherwise do. I'm sure that's right if the directors actually come for proper professional advice at the appropriate point in time. Uh, of course, they don't always do that, uh, which happily keeps us in work from time to time. So there's the, there is a duty. This is what we call it. Crucially, when is the duty engaged? So before this case, I think there were probably five options. So option one at the earliest point in time is when there's a real risk of insolvency. And the claimants in this case had to get home on that in order to win. Going up in time, going sort of a bit closer, you've got likely to become insolvent. That was what the Court of Appeal said was at least part of the test. Then you've got verge of insolvency, which is an expression that had been used in previous case laws. Then you've got fourthly actual insolvency, where I think everyone pretty much agreed the duty was going to be at least there. Or fifthly, it's section 214 wrongful trading, effectively when you're doomed, uh, but not before. So those were the sort of main five options. Where do we get to? Um, something in between, but more towards a favorable um, approach to directors later in time. So what we've got there, as you can see, Lord Briggs and Lord Kitchen talk about imminent insolvency. I think, I think what they mean by that is imminent, a state of insolvency. So cash flow insolvency or balance sheet insolvency, or the probability of an insolvent liquidation or administration about which the directors know or ought to know. So it's two alternatives. You've got to be almost insolvent, mm -hmm. not a likelihood of becoming insolvent, therefore a, a less strict test than in the Court <clears> of <throat> Appeal, or the probability of the likelihood of actually having um, a liquidation. So that's their approach. I think that Lord Reed agrees with them because he referred to insolvent or bordering on insolvency. I don't think there's anything different between imminent and bordering. 
pity they couldn't use the same words. I don't know why they use different words. And they both said, we think we agree with each other. There's nothing between us. Well, if he wasn't, can you please use the same words? Because that would just be helpful. But there we are. And he makes Lord Beasley make it very clear, a likelihood of insolvency is not sufficient. So court of appeal decision, to that extent, they did not agree with. And so it pushes the bar in favor of the director. Um, Lord Hodge, insolvent or bordering on insolvency, same kind of thing. Uh, and Lady Arden says, whenever a company is financially distressed, which is not, in my view, a very helpful phrase, but she agrees with Lord Reed at number 12. So she's agreeing effectively with everyone else. So I think we can go this far if it's almost insolvent or it's likely to go into insolvent liquidation then the duty is engaged. Question, do the directors need to know or ought they to have known about that? Is there a, a knowledge test for directors? Um, probably. Because Lord Briggs and Lord Kitchen say so, so that's two of them. I think Lord Hodge says the same, so that's three of them. Lord Reed's not really certain about that, so he's probably a bit doubtful. But Lady Arden um, thinks it probably is some kind of knowledge test because she says it's closer to 214, which is quite similar to known or ought to have known. So I think you've got three saying directors need to know or ought to have known two not really committing themselves, but that's that's a majority. And even those that aren't so sure, such as Lord Reed and Lady Arden say, in reality, directors are gonna know most of the time. They're responsible for the books and records. They should know what's going on. It's unlikely to have a disconnect uh, between those uh, two positions. So I think it's now pretty clear that when the duty is engaged, and you might ask, you may not ask, you may not care at all, but anyway, I'll go tell you anyway, why have they pushed it that way more in favor of the directors? Uh, and the answer is they didn't want to have too much of a chilling effect on enterprise, on director's discretion, on commercial judgment, on undermining, save and so far as necessary, the underlying principle you're exercising your duties in the interests of members and the other interests set out in section 172.1. So I think we've got to a stage of a, of a pretty clear answer, and which is a commercially, in my, my view, um, sensible position to get in. It's not just right at the end of the road, but it's reasonably close to it, at which point uh, the duty kicks in. Right. Insolvency. I just want to just come back to this point, which I, which I, which I flagged earlier, because the meaning of insolvency in this context is obviously crucial because if you talk about imminent insolvency, what is insolvency? I said earlier, this baby wasn't developed very much in argument. According to Lord Reed's judgment, the court had no submissions on the question of what is meant by insolvency, which you might think was a, a little bit odd. Um, Lord Briggs and Lord Kitchen approached it in conventional fashion to say we've got two forms of insolvency, as I highlighted earlier, cash flow insolvency, balance sheet mm -hmm. insolvency. Um, and they seem to be applying those tests. They make it clear that you can have short-term insolvency or indeed be balance sheet insolvent as a startup companies often are, but there's still light at the end of the tunnel. And, but when they said that, I don't think they were saying it's not insolvent in that situation. Uh, they're just saying that that's relevant to how you approach the question of duty, which Mark will talk about uh, in a minute. Uh, Lord Reed said he thought the tests were in section 123. Um, Lord Hodge agreed with Lord Briggs generally, subject to any mm -hmm. comments he made, and didn't make any comments on this. So I think we've got a clear majority saying when you think about insolvency, it's the tests we're familiar with. Um, Lady Arden took a slightly different approach. I, just unpack briefly. Um, she says it, is, says it is the test in section 123. The tests have to be applied with a degree of flexibility appropriate to the rational and context of the rule in West Mercia. Okay, what does that mean? She says there's got to be some minor latitude so that prompt payment is not insisted on. But as we've already discussed, 
in chain finance, for example, Briggs had already said, well, you know, temporary, brief, temporary cash flow insolvency probably isn't commercial cash flow insolvency. It's got to be endemic shortage of cash. So it seems to me that criteria is already built into the test of insolvency. And then she said she agrees with Lord Briggs that temporary commercial insolvency should be excluded. He didn't actually say that at all in the judgment, as far as I read it. I think she can only be referring back to chain finance uh, and sort of incorporating that into, into his reasoning and, and her reasoning. So I'm not sure how helpful that is, but what's clear, it seems to me, is from the majority, it's the conventional insolvency tests, and that's your starting point from them working back to say, is it imminent? Are you on the borderline? And does that information or should that information lead to the conclusion there's going to be an insolvent liquidation or an insolvent administration? So, Mark, the content of the duty. Yeah, thanks, James. And um, before I move on to that, <clears throat> just want to pick up on uh, one point of James's about uh, understanding why um, there's the uh, creditor's duty, and because that helps us with the content of it. One of the examples uh, given in the judgment is imagine the hypothetical situation uh, whereby a company has exactly enough money to pay all of its creditors and nothing more. Uh, and in those circumstances, the shareholders have everything to gain, but nothing to lose. Uh, their position can't get any worse. It can only get better. Uh, the creditors, on the other hand, with the company with every penny to um, pay them in full, have everything to lose because the company might lose some of that money, but nothing to gain because their position uh, can't get any better. Uh, and I think that's a useful way of looking at what I'm going to talk about with the content of the duty, which is about balancing uh, creditors' interests and shareholders' interests. Uh, one fundamental point, because we talk about the creditor duty, is that the director's duty is, in fact, always the same. The director's duty is to act in the interests of the company. And what changes is what the interests of the company are rather than what the content uh, of the duty is. The duty is always to act in the interests of the company. But where the rule applies, and as James has said, that's where the company is insolvent or bordering on insolvency, uh, but it's not faced with an inevitable insolvency, then the duty to act in the interests of the company has to reflect that there are both interests to the shareholders, the members, and there are interests uh, to uh, the creditors. Uh, then we get to a point further down the line where insolvency is inevitable. And in that circumstance, the members, the shareholders are going to have very little, if any, uh, interest at all to be weighed into the balance. And the creditors' interests are going to be almost exclusively the ones with which the directors are uh, concerned. In between bordering on insolvency and insolvency inevitable, there is what could be termed a sliding scale, where the directors have to balance against one another the interests of the shareholders and the interests of the creditors. And the closer along the track, the company is from bordering on insolvency to insolvency inevitable, the greater the creditors' interests will weigh in the scale of that balancing act. It may be that creditors' and members' interests uh, are aligned. However, in a circumstance where the company is bordering on insolvency and moving along that track, there's a likelihood that the uh, uh, interests of members and the interests of creditors are going to be in conflict. And the content of the duty of directors faced with that is to balance those two competing factors, taking into account an appropriate level of members' interests, an appropriate level of creditors' interests, depending upon how far along the track from bordering on insolvency to insolvency imminent uh, the company is. Uh, now, uh, going back to what James said uh, at the outset, uh, is that uh, really uh, a groundbreaking law uh, to think that from bordering on insolvency to insolvency inevitable, there is a sliding scale of consideration of the interests uh, of creditors. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, I was telling James just this morning, 20 years ago, I remember writing an essay in my insolvency masters about West Mercia uh, that said just that sliding scale uh, from uh, uh, towards insolvency. Uh, and the more you take into account uh, the interests of creditors. Uh, but what is important is uh, that whereas we've had six or seven different cases trying to tell us about this, now at least we can go to one authority and say, look, uh, here's uh, the sliding scale uh, of the interests uh, of creditors. A key point in the case itself was whether a lawful dividend uh, could amount uh, to uh, or, or, or did engage uh, the creditor duty. Uh, do the directors have to have regard uh, to creditors' interests when they decide whether to make a lawful dividend? And the argument on this point was uh, focused towards, look, the Companies Act provides protection for companies, their creditors and their shareholders that says that these are the very restrictive terms in which you can declare a dividend. This company had complied with all of the requirements uh, for uh, the declaration uh, of a dividend. So why should we have extra requirements on whether you can declare this dividend or not? Uh, and that's the argument saying credit to duty shouldn't apply at all for dividends. Uh, but the court held uh, that yes, uh, the credit to duty does apply uh, to a dividend, even if it's lawful within uh, the meaning of the Companies Act. Uh, the provisions relating to dividends do not oust other duties. In other words, just because you've complied with the Companies Act 2006 doesn't mean you can declare a dividend whenever and however uh, you want. Because those provisions in the Companies Act really look at the balance sheet provision of the company. Uh, they don't look uh, to things like cash flow solvency. They don't look to a balancing exercise of those who may have an interest in the company. And that's why you need to have the creditor duty alongside uh, the uh, requirements of the Companies Act as well. So moving on to that, one of the unanswered questions, uh, and James is gonna start us off. Yes, so I mean, obviously there's a number of unanswered questions around what we've just been talking about, just precisely how that will be applied in practice. But I think we've got to a, a reasonably uh, clear picture on the law, but that doesn't necessarily make it easier for you to advise or for us to advise um, how exactly to exercise powers in a particular situation. But some of the areas, other areas the judges discussed, which I think are interesting and useful. First of all, section 239 of the Insolvency Act, so um, preference claims. Part of the argument I've already touched on was we've got section 214, we've got section 239, you just don't need a director's duty on top of that. That argument was very firmly rejected because not least because there's a number of obvious differences between a claim for breach of fiduciary duty and, and a claim in preference. If I sound like I'm teaching you to suck eggs, they spent, Lord Reed spent quite a lot of time discussing that uh, in his judgment. Um, obviously, 239 claims can be by liquidators, there's time frame constraints, there's particular statutory requirements, and the relief is very different. I'll come back to that point in a moment. And if you want Supreme Court authority for what has been commonly accepted practice for a number of years, just because there's a breach of 239, doesn't mean the directors are going to be in breach of their duties. You've now got it from Lord Reed. More difficult issue which has come up in case law is whether or not you can get an effective remedy for breach of fiduciary duty where the director causes the company to make a preference either to himself or to someone else. And the argument has been, well, so you've preferred someone, but that hasn't caused any loss to the company. It's balance sheet neutral. Uh, and that argument has had some traction, uh, at least in the past, and hasn't been fully resolved. There's a number of possible arguments um, to support the granting of relief. One is if the preference is paid to the director himself, you can say that he has made a profit, representing the amount he's got more than he would have got in the actual liquidation. Uh, and that allows relief to be granted. The other argument is the trust analogy. So in a trust case, if a trustee improperly removes money from the fund, he has to reconstitute or she has to reconstitute the fund, um, regardless of the pure balance sheet position. 
And we, I think that Lord Reed says that because the West Mercia case itself was about a preference given by the director to himself, his provisional view that West Mercia was correct, i.e. that relief could be granted um, in that situation. And Lady Arden agreed with him and actually at 402 referred to a well-known trust case. So I think there's some pretty decent Supreme Court support, but it's all over to, um, for the unresolved point, can you get relief uh, for preferences by way of fiduciary duty? Of course, this only really works in an insolvency context, because if the company is solvent, the money just goes around in circles. Uh, if it's in an insolvency context, that seems to be good, good support. Um, the other area to talk about is the proper purpose duty in section 171B of the Companies Act. Um, certainly since John Randall's decision in HLC, uh, I've been pleading, I'm sure Mark has as well, that in these cases, not only breach of section 172, but breach of the proper purpose um, duty. And the purpose being, we say, or argued, when you're in the insolvency situation or close to it, the purposes have to include advancing the interests of creditors. So if that payment, that transaction didn't advance the interests of creditors, you've got a breach of section 171. And the advantage of that is, it slightly, can be slightly easier to prove a breach of that because you don't have to prove the director acted in bad faith or uh, completely disregarded the interests of creditors. And you can just see, did, were part of his purposes advancing the interests of creditors, which is it's a, it's a sort of split objective subjective test. So it may be, may be slightly easier. And Lord Reed, Lord Hodge, and Lady Arden in different ways, and I won't get into all the nuances, uh, supported the argument that the duty to creditors infects is probably the wrong word, but influences and is relevant to section 171. And I think that's quite an important practical point uh, when pleading claims and going forward. Mark, 214. Yeah, so another of the arguments made was that we don't need the creditor duty because we've got um, powers under uh, section 214 of the Insolvency Act 1986. So that's wrongful trading. And that in circumstances where uh, directors know or ought to know uh, that there's no uh, real prospect of avoiding insolvent liquidation, uh, then uh, the uh, directors can be ordered to contribute towards the assets of the company unless they can show that they took every step uh, with a view uh, to uh, avoiding loss to creditors. Uh, and so the court was faced with looking at what are the differences between the creditor duty and the section 214 duty that would justify having the two running uh, concurrently. Uh, and what the court says is, well, there's a number of differences between the creditor duty, as we've expressed it, and uh, the duty under Section 214. Uh, firstly, the Section 214 duty uh, applies later than the creditor duty. So the creditor duty comes in where the company's bordering on insolvency. Section 214, uh, where you know or ought to know uh, that there's no real prospect of avoiding insolvent liquidation. Section 214, coming in later as it does, then imposes a more onerous duty on uh, directors. It's to take every step uh, to avoid uh, loss, as opposed to taking creditors' interests into account uh, in the balance. Uh, then it said another difference is that there's a difference in the remedies that are available. The, in breach of duty, you're looking at equitable remedies uh, for breach of fiduciary duties. Uh, and that's uh, circumscribed by rules, uh, loss, causation, uh, and equity. Uh, however, the remedy under Section 214 is to make a contribution towards the assets of the company, uh, and that's in the discretion uh, of the court. Uh, Section 214 can only apply if there is, in fact, uh, a winding up uh, later on. Uh, whereas you may have a circumstance where the creditor duty has been engaged because the company was bordering on insolvency, acts are taken to the detriment of particular creditors, but the company manages to turn it around, never enters into uh, liquidation at all, but the creditor 
uh, who uh, the duty to whom was breached uh, still suffers uh, a loss. Only a liquidator can bring proceedings under Section 214. That, to my mind, is a significant procedural difference uh, between uh, the two causes of action. But when we can assign causes of action, uh, uh, does that make that much uh, difference? Uh, and uh, what the court did say was that Section 214 can only be used against a director or a former director. Well, uh, where uh, uh, the concept of director under the Insolvency Act includes a de facto director or a shadow director, and where the creditor duty uh, is a duty owed by directors uh, to the company, is that really a difference between Section 214 uh, and uh, the creditor duty? Uh, so I was left perhaps with an impression uh, that the court was trying to find differences, uh, whether or not uh, they were really there. Uh, to justify the existence of these two different causes of action together. Uh, so in terms of areas for development, what would be interesting to see is a case where both the wrongful trading cause of action uh, and the credit of duty cause of action are run concurrently uh, to see where the court draws the dividing line uh, between uh, the two and how they interact together. So the bit that you've all been waiting for, uh, the practical advice, what do you take from all of this? Uh, and James is going to look first in relation to your advisory work. And before doing that, I was just one bit on the 214 point in Briggs's judgment. And you, the you, you judgment comes out and you, you're looking and the judge says, oh, and if only counsel has argued this point, you, oh, you know, cringy. Briggs said this, it is in passing an irony of the present case, the May dividend has being found to have offended section 423, but no claim is involved for that reason alone, a breach of duty by respondent directors has ever been pursued. And was a bit of a sort of sting in the tail, almost he's suggesting, well, if you said that was a breach of duty because it was a breach of 423, I might've been interested. I'm not sure it's consistent with the rest of the judgment. Anyway, that's paragraph 182, query where that, that uh, will go, if anywhere. Um, right, well, we've sort of, Giving you the framework, I'm sure you've already been thinking about existing cases you've got, scenarios, um, and there's obviously a, a multitude of circumstances. These are sort of the big points, I think. Um, in theory, the duty is narrower or doesn't arise until later, might be a better description, than the Court of Appeal had said. But it's still that practical, difficult point. You know, is it insolvent? Is it on the verge of insolvency? Is a liquidation or an insolvent administration probable? Now, those are still extremely difficult questions to ask and to answer, and that hasn't gone away. Interestingly, um, Lord Hodge said, it may only be in rare circumstances that issues arise whether there should be a remedy outside 214. In other words, he's saying we've got section 214, that's likely to sweep up most sort of insolvency cases. And this creditor's duty, maybe it won't, won't be found to be breached on many occasions outside that. Well, uh, I'm not sure necessarily Lord Hodge has got his finger on the wrongful trading pulse mm -hmm. because the patient's in hospital on life support. I, mean, I can't remember the last time I brought a wrongful trading claim and the case law is not helpful to that at all. People, my experience, are now currently avoiding wrongful trading claims like the plague and that breach of duty, breach of creditors' duty claims are far, far more common. So maybe the rarefied atmosphere of the Supreme Court doesn't always quite reflect um, the practical reality. But what all the judges said was, and Marx touched on this, is about this balancing exercise between the members and the creditors. But the message that comes at least from some of the judgments is, a reasonable decision to attempt to rescue a company's business in the interest of members and creditors is unlikely to be a breach. And again, as in the usual way, you know, if it's minuted, it's documented, if it's on the basis of good advice, the courts are still going to be slow to interfere with that. If it's done on the hoof without proper records, where the suspicion is the directors are promoting their own interests, uh, clearly it's going to be uh, different. But I think there is a sense from the judgment and the moving of the boundaries, the court doesn't want to interfere overly in directors' commercial judgments in those difficult situations. But one point the judges do seem to be clear on, and this was 
um, Lady Arden's phrase, insolvency deepening activities. So this is a sort of where you've got probably going to have to go into insolvency. But if you undertake a risky venture, that might put it back into uh, solvency for the benefit of members. But if it fails, that's going to make the creditors' position even worse. To do what Mark was talking about earlier, members have got nothing to lose by that because they're out of the money uh, unless something happens. But creditors have got everything to lose from that. So that particular situation is unlikely to be viewed favorably by the courts. Betting the farm was the uh, the expression we used to use for that. Betting the farm. Betting the farm. Yeah. So I think. The commercial, the genuine commercial attempt to, 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 to rescue the business, as opposed to the betting the farm, the last punt, those are the sort of reasonably clear water between those two. What the judges, um, most of them don't talk about, although Lady Arjun mentioned, was about the duty being engaged if you're proposing to enter into a transaction which would put the company into insolvency or verge of insolvency. Um, she was clear the duty should apply at that point. But it seems to me that probably more, more often than not, the claims we deal with are not quasi wrongful trading claims. They're you paid yourself £100,000 whilst the company was insolvent, and that got nothing to do with trying to save the business, um, or you sold the property as an undervalue. We're, we're all, I think those are much more familiar. And I do get, again, the sense from the Supreme Court judgment that that sort of focus on the sort of more common transactions rather than the trying to save the business transactions that sort of maybe got a bit lost or wasn't focused on in the same way and um, finally principles of ratification was discussed and they are unchanged members cannot ratify transactions proposed transactions if the creditor's duty is engaged so there's an absolute symmetry of each side of the same coin between those two so that hasn't changed at all um, other than that, good luck. Mark? Yeah, so final point is to look at proceedings that are uh, on foot or uh, in the pipeline. Uh, and what do we need to do with those to ensure that we're uh, uh, on track uh, with what the Supreme Court uh, says? Uh, and I think looking at current proceedings, uh, as I say, whether they're issued or whether they're in the pipeline, the first thing to look at is how is the duty pleaded? Because I think it's not unusual to see in the past uh, the duty pleaded as a duty to creditors, whereas we know that the duty is to the company that takes into account the interests of creditors balanced against shareholders. So uh, do you need to look again at the way that the duty uh, has been pleaded? Is insolvency reliable? Uh, are you saying this company uh, was insolvent? Uh, and if so, have you identified a date at which you can say uh, that the company was insolvent? Or are you relying on bordering on insolvency? Uh, and if so, have you identified a date at which you can say at that point the company was bordering on insolvency? Now, those two dates, for reasons that we clear from what I've said before, are absolutely key. Because if you can say here's insolvency inevitable and here's bordering on insolvency, then you can say that you're in the creditor duty period if the transactions that you're impugning happened within that time. Then you can start to assess what the relevant balance should have been between shareholders and creditors during the relevant period. But if you're not sure when bordering on insolvency starts or you're not sure when actual insolvency or inevitable insolvency happens, then it's far more difficult to try and pin down uh, for your court that actually we're in uh, uh, the relevant zone. Uh, big flag, have you relied upon uh, real and not remote risk uh, of insolvency? Uh, that's a problem if you have done, uh, and that uh, all those wording and wording certainly do need uh, to be reviewed uh, and uh, uh, changed. And then how, have the, how is the breach of duty pleaded? Uh, have you said uh, that, oh, you failed to take into account the interests of creditors? Because if we know the duty is to come to the company, part of which is the duty uh, to creditors, then saying you fail to take into account uh, uh, the duty to creditors only succeeds if you fail to take, into, uh, take them into account at all. Because what you're really saying 
is you fail to take into account uh, the interests of creditors sufficiently or at all, because that's giving effect to the balancing exercise and the duty uh, needs to be looked at. Here's the duty to take into account uh, uh, interest of creditors, interest of shareholders. Here's the balancing exercise that you should have done. You put the interest of members or yourself up here and then the interest of creditors down here. Whereas what you should have done is put the interest of creditors up here and the interest of others down there. So you need to have, in my view, uh, in pleading these claims, uh, the proper uh, uh, identification of here's the balance. You fail to take into account this interest sufficiently. Uh, or at all. So uh, that's everything that we've got to say uh, on uh, 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 BTI against Squana. Uh, I should have said we'll take questions as we go through, but I think you've all been fairly quiet. Does anybody <laughs> want to take the opportunity to uh, ask us any questions? Yeah. If you've got a shareholder who says you're putting money in, does that sort of Potential contingent savior. Um, James, do you want to answer that one? <laughs> <laughs> I think it depends whether you're looking at the whether you're looking at the cash flow test or the balance sheet test. Under the balance sheet test, you're not allowed to look at future or contingent assets. Um, so unless there's a financial commitment, it seems to me you have to leave that out of account on, on the finances. And of course, if the money comes in, if it's owed, it's just going to be it's, it's going to be neutral on the balance sheet test anyway. But I don't see why you couldn't rely on it on the commercial test to say, well, look, we've got a temporary thing, but there's some money coming in from the shareholder. Or even if it's maybe it's not quite good enough to, to stave off cash flow insolvency, it's certainly good enough to say there was still light at the end of the tunnel. So the duty hadn't shifted completely in favour of creditors. We still had hope, therefore we're still balancing it out. Is it one way to answer that to say that the element of futurity on the cash flow test has to take into account both credits and debits? I think it must do, yeah. yeah. Uh, any others? Yeah. yeah. Talk about balancing exercise and sliding scale, which yes. gives the impression that a scientific sort of approach is going to be applied. Does, will that feed into quantum as well of damages that you kind of say, well, that was 80% engaged, therefore the damages should reflect the degree that and there should be some science applied to both ends of the mm. transaction? Um, I think the answer to that is no. Mm. Uh, the, what you're looking at here is whether there is a breach of the duty. Uh, and once there is a breach of the duty, then you're into what loss that breach has caused. Um, so I don't think you could say you took into account creditors' interest 60%, you should have done it 80%, therefore you're 20% liable for the loss. I think that elides the questions of breach, causation, loss and damage. You've got to say, did you take into account the creditors' interest properly in the balance? If you did, then there's no liability. If you didn't, uh, then you are liable. And now let's look at issues of causation, loss and damage. I think we, a slight variant on that, what you could have is like a whole series of transactions, maybe directors paying himself 50,000 a month mm -hmm. and there's 10 transactions and the first five, you're okay, but the next five, all the balance is tipped then in favor because it's yeah. insolvent liquidations become inevitable. Therefore you lose on the five, but not in the first five. That's a really good example. But... Right. Okay, well, I think we're both going to be outside uh, having another cup of coffee. We'll be lucky. I hope. Um, <laughs> but if you have any other questions that you want to share with James or I, uh, or not the rest of the room, uh, then, <laughs> um, then please do. But uh, I'll just finish off by saying thank you so much yeah. for coming in to see us. It's great to see you all. Thank you. Yeah.